Is it good? Okay. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay. Let's get started. I think it's time. You may want to add the Ethernet cable here that's working. I don't think the Ethernet cable is connected, so maybe you can take a look at that. That's why it's a bit slow, but okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. Oh, it's good to see so many people here. Is this the one that's working? Just make sure you find the right one. Otherwise it causes problems. So we're going to continue from where we left off last time. Uh, now we're delving into logic design, combinational logic, and we have a lot of things, exciting things to cover. Basically, we're, we're gonna build up processors like what we have uh, been seeing recently. But just to remind you, you have a bunch of extra credit assignments uh, that are in front of you. If you do this one, you'll get one extra credit. It's, you, can each, you can watch either of the videos. One is slightly longer than the other, but that's a little bit more up to date also. Ho hopefully it'll be fun. Or, and remember, you can watch John Lee's talk on Cerebras systems, which is a cutting edge machine learning accelerator and also write a review about it. And there are some readings. I mean, you know the deal with the readings, even though they are called required, as long as you understand the concepts and can solve the problems. This is not, none of this is really required in my opinion, because we cover a lot in the lectures. Uh, but uh, if you want to reinforce what, you, what we cover in the lectures, by the end of next week, we will be done with these chapters. Of course, we're not covering every single thing in the, uh, what that's covered in the readings, right? As you will notice. Okay, so we started covering combinational logic circuits and design. Uh, let me just jog your memory in terms of where we are. We actually, in the last lecture, we started with transistors as switches, and then we start building logic gates on top of them, which were combinational circuits. And we talked about Boolean algebra, which many of you know. We will talk a little bit more about Boolean algebra today. Just got muted on Zoom. Participants can now see my screen. That's good. It doesn't look muted to me. How about now? Now we can hear again. Okay, now it's good. Okay, just to again uh, remind you, all computers are built on the same building blocks. So after this class, you should be able to build any computer, in my opinion, hopefully. And we talked about some of them. In fact, while we were talking about this, this was announced two days ago, this ultra chip which is interesting because it's actually this M1 Max chip uh, combined together with interposers, very high speed interconnects in between. But you can see that technology is progressing so fast today that people are announcing chips almost every month or so. I mean, within this month, within the last month, since we started the class actually, the uh, in-memory computing chip from Hynix was announced. And then more recently, this huge, chip from Apple was announced. I mean, technically it's two chips that are connected together. We have very high speed interconnect, but you can see that it's a big guy. And you can see that, uh, I, I just want to point out this number over here. It's 114 billion transistors on a general purpose CPU that can go into your machines basically. And never lose perspective. That's the processor chip. This is really the, let's say a big part of the system. You can see that the processor chip is here. A lot of it is memory and the rest is interconnect. So memory is actually much larger than the processor chip. This has 128 gigabytes of memory, but as we discussed earlier, memory is a huge bottleneck. So never ever forget the memory. We will, we will talk a lot about processor chips. Today we'll talk a lot about combinational logic. Tomorrow we will start talking a little bit about memory, but a lot of the front end of the course will be actually uh, related to processor chip design, which is the CPU, let's say, or GPU or FPJ, whatever you would like to think about. And we will come to the memory toward the end of this course, but don't forget that that's the bottleneck. Okay, just to jog your memory, we've been covering some of these to motivate you, let's say. And all of these essentially consist of the same building blocks. That's my purpose of those pictures. And today we're gonna cover the combination logic blocks. 
But before that, just to, again, jog your memory, we talked about transistor as a switching, as a switch, as a basic building block, right? And if you're really interested in uh, transistor innovation and how these things are built at a very high level, not from a, let's say, very scientific perspective, Intel has this nice five-minute video that talks about the transistor innovation that they have done to enable, uh, to make these transistors smaller and smaller. And I like this video, actually. It's a, it's a five-minute video. It's a, it's a good job that was done for five minutes. Clearly, we're not going to get a lot of technical knowledge out of it, but I like this picture also. This is where the transistor started, and this is where they are today. You cannot even see them, right, compared to what they were, let's say, 40 years ago. So that's Moore's law, essentially. That's how transistors got smaller and smaller. I'd recommend doing that. And the way these things are fabricated are, this is one of the, many, this is the, the, one of the latest manufacturing devices. It's called the extreme ultraviolet technology, as we discussed, right? This is manufactured by ASML, which is a company in uh, the Netherlands. And this is actually a, a very fascinating technology. It uses this extreme ultraviolet light to etch the transistors on top of a silicon substrate, on top of wafer, essentially. And again, this is a short video by Intel that talks about how this machine at a very, very high level works. Okay, so never forget that there is a lot of technology. By, by the way, I think, uh, I think uh, this video mentions that this machine is 200 tons. So it requires a lot of uh, flights plus trains plus trucks to actually uh, move, move it from Europe all the way to uh, the United States or wherever people use this for manuf manufacturing, actually. Okay, so from transistors, we build logic gates, and this was one of the slides that we discussed. We know how a MOS transistor works. How do we build logic structures? out of the transistor. And that's where we moved from the devices to logic, basically. Okay, we call that, we covered the CMOS NOT, NAND, and AND gates. And hopefully this should be, uh, you should be able to name these gates in your sleep, in my opinion, at this point, maybe. <laughs> maybe not at this point, maybe two weeks later, you will be able to do that. And we also talked about some of the other gates. And we we're gonna cover more of these gates. So just to jog your memory, this is the inverter. Bubble means you always invert, that's the complement. Uh, and this year, NAND this year, you can see that there's a complement. NAND is not the end. OR is here, NOR is here, complemented again. And XOR is here, and then XNOR is here. And all of these gates are specified by their truth tables. That's how we, we specify the functions, basically, truth tables. Today, we're going to look at a different way of specifying functions. So that's how we came to combinational logic circuits. And we were talking about two types of circuits, combinational versus sequential. Tomorrow, we will come to sequential. Hopefully, today, we will cover at least the most important concepts in combinational circuits, tomorrow we will see sequential logic. So combinational logic is basically memoryless, right? Outputs strictly depend on the inputs right now. You don't remember anything in the past. Tomorrow we will see how we build memory. And Boolean logic equ equations enable us to functionally specify. So basically you need functional specification and timing specification for any circuit. And we're talking about functional specification right now. We'll talk about timing later on. Lecture eight. Okay. So recall, these slides are all actually old for you, maybe except for the Apple M1 Max, uh, M1 Ultra slides. Uh, so basically, we are trying to functionally specify the circuit. And we talked about, uh, let's move over here right now. We talked about a full adder. We're going to cover the full adder later today. So what do Boolean equations enable us? Basically, they enable us to do this functional specification, represent the function of a combination logic block, also a sequential logic block, as we will see tomorrow. But today, we are concerned about combination logic. They also enable us to methodically transform the function into simpler functions, basically simpler representation of the functions. Why? Because these lead to different hardware realizations. You have different logic gates that you can implement these different expressions, Boolean expressions. This is called logic minimization or simplification. And this is important because this enables us uh, multiple things. Clearly, it enables us to find a good logic representation of a function, good in terms of the design point, meaning timing, latency, area, how many gates do you actually use to implement this? Do the gates actually exist in what, you actually, what you're actually building, the underlying technology layers? But you can also automate this process. So today we're going to talk about how to represent these functions in a very methodical way, starting with the SOP, sum of products form, for example, so that you can feed this information, function representation, to a machine, and the machine can actually automate the simplification and uh, minimization. This is also called computer-aided design. This is one aspect of computer-aided design, of course. It's also called electronic design automation. And different Boolean expressions lead to, as I said, different logic gate implementations, right? And this is important because different logic gate implementations have different area, cost, latency, and energy requirements. If you can implement a function in two gates, 
it's probably a good idea to not spend thousand gates on it, right? And if you're if you can simplify the function uh, from let's say uh, a Boolean expression that requires thousand gates to a Boolean expression that requires only two gates, that sounds great to me. Right? That's the idea, basically. So we will see that. And that's why we were covering these Boolean expressions. We have this Boolean algebra. There are many useful laws. We talked about axioms, laws, and you know, hopefully, all of this. How many people know Boolean algebra now? OK, now everybody raised their hand. That's good, almost everybody. Because of the fog, I cannot see very well. Um, <laughs> maybe I selectively not see the hands that are not raised. But I, I expect a lot of people have learned about Boolean algebra based on what you have said uh, last time. And we covered all, uh, a good chunk of it, actually. And you will do some of this. And there will be some questions in the exam, frankly, related to this. And useful laws, uh, the simplification theorems are actually very useful. But you use these other laws actually to get to these simplification theorems also. So to simplify functions, you, you need to really know Boolean algebra are nice. And you need to apply what uh, different, uh, different laws uh, and different simplification theorems at different times. So hopefully you remember some of these. And we talked about the Morgan's law. The Morgan's law is interesting because it's also used to change the representation of a function, right? Basically, this is the transformation. I'm not going to go over it again. I like thinking of things as logically. When I see a Boolean equation, it's good to think of things as logically. Basically, the logical transformation is that this function says at least one of ABC is true. The Morgan says it's not the case that ABC are all false. And this, these are logically equivalent, right? That's, that's why it's called logic. <laughs> OK, so why is, it why is it interesting to do these transformations? The Morgan's law is one example of transformation because it enables you to uh, convert between different type of logic functions. So for example, if you do not have every type of gate, for, for some reason, implement in the underlying device level, or if some gate types are more desirable to use than others because they're more faster, they're more efficient, they're more area efficient, uh, they're more energy efficient, then you, you basically can transform, for example, this NOR gate to this AND gate and inverters. And this NAND gate to this uh, OR gate and inverters. And this also called bubble pushing. If you remember last time, you can actually look at a circuit pictorially and push the bubbles to the back and change the type of the gate. That's what we did. Right? And these are the equivalence classes, basically. This gate is equivalent to this gate, essentially, with the inverters, of course. Don't forget the inverters. They're very important. And you can determine this through the truth table. You can determine this through the Morgan's laws. And you can prove the Morgan's laws also, as we discussed. OK. So that's where we actually stopped off yesterday. This was a quick summary uh, to, to jog your memory because we're going to build on it today. Uh, we started using Boolean equations to represent a logic circuit. And now let's, we're going to become a little bit more, more methodical. Basically, our goal initially in this lecture is to enable a single universally agreed on way of representing a logic function, a Boolean logic function, starting from its truth table. So you have a truth table. You know what you want to implement. And you want to represent it such that everybody in the world understands it and agrees on, including the computers that are going to simplify it. These are also called canonical representations, standardized representations. And we're going to look at two forms. I'm going to especially focus on the sum of products form, because you will see that product of sums form is actually the De Morgan of the inverse of the sum of products form. If this doesn't make sense, you will see what that means uh, later on. OK, so the key idea is very simple, actually. Assume you have the truth table of a Boolean function f. Now I need to move this over here. How do you express the function in terms of the inputs in a standard manner? And that's the sum of product form, one of them. There are two forms like this. You express the truth table as a two-level Boolean expression, basically. And you will see what this is. Uh, that contains all input variable combinations that result in a one output. One is true. Zero is false. That's what I'm going to assume. So if any of the combinations of the input variables that results in a one is true, then the function is true, right? So uh, you have a truth table with some input variables. You list all of the combinations, and you pick the ones that result in a true output. I'm going to give you an example of this soon, so don't worry if you don't understand this, let's say, uh, theoretical explanation right now. So basically, function is, can be expressed simply as the or of all the input variable combinations that result in a one. OK, so we're going to see this uh, with an example soon. But before that, let me give you some definitions, because it's good to uh, there's actually formal theory behind this. I'm not going to be extremely theoretical, but it's good to be somewhat theoretical, let's say, to define. Uh, so complement, we already discussed this. It's a variable with a bar over it, right? A bar, A's complement is A bar. Oh, okay. Literal is a variable or it's complement. So this is called a literal. These are all literals, as you can see. If you have three input, uh, uh, three, uh, if you have a three input function, ABC, then these are all the literals that you can have in the 
uh, in your function expression. Implicant is a product or end of literals. Basically, you can end any combination of these literals, and then you get implicant. These are implicants. And then what we are really interested in this min term, this is the product or end that includes all input variables. So and uh, and it is and is an and, and gate right it's a it's a logical end function it's also called a product because and we use uh, we, we express it as a dot as, as you can see over here so a min term uh, includes all of the input variables and expresses the products so you know exactly how many min terms you have in a function that has n input variables you have two to the n min terms right because if you have n input variables you have two to the n uh, lines in the truth table and each of them corresponds to a different min term that's of the truth table is defined, a Boolean truth table is defined. Next term is essentially uh, the sum or or that includes all input variables. So again, in this terminology, or is a plus, it's also called sum, uh, and it includes all input variables of a function. If a, if a function has three input variables, the max term needs to have three of these input variables uh, as, as literals, as you can see. Okay, so this is theory. Let's take a look at what this looks like uh, in, with an example. Well, after this, I think. So uh, we call that truth table is really the signature of a Boolean function, right? Uh, that's, you, can, you can express any function using its truth table, but it's an expensive representation. For example, if a function has 10 inputs, you have two to the 10 lines in the truth table, right? That's 1,024 lines. That's a lot. That's why it's expensive. If a function has 100 inputs, that's two to the 100 lines. That's, again, a lot. And a Boolean function may have many alternative Boolean expressions. Uh, it may have, as we discussed earlier, right? It may have more simpler forms. It may have more uh, sophisticated forms, uh, but uh, they all have the same truth table, basically. So the, uh, essentially, they all express the same function. So why do we care? As, as we discussed earlier, uh, different Boolean expressions lead to different logic gate realizations. That's why we care about the equivalence of functions, right? Again, you don't want to implement a function that requires really only two gates with 1,000 gates. So someone may give you a truth table. Okay, here's my 1,000 input function, and here's the output. And you're a hardware designer, and you can, you can implement that truth table with maybe only two gates if you simplify it, or with 1,000 gates or even more. Right? Which one do you choose? I would choose the two gates again. Probably those two gates are, let's say, simple gates. That's assuming that, right? So basically, that's the idea over here. So how do we actually get to those two gates, get to that simplified form of a function? You start with this canonical form, standard form, because that provides a unique algebraic signature that you can start from that everybody agrees on. So let's start with the canonical form of this function. So this is the sum of products form. You may also see it as disjunctive normal form or min term expansion. I like sum of products because it really expresses what the equation looks like, right? So this is our function. Somebody gave this truth table to you. I don't care what it implements really, frankly, at this point, my task is to design it. Uh, my task is to design logic for it. So it looks interesting, right? So sum of product form starts with uh, finding all the input combinations or min terms, remember the min terms, for which the output of the function is true. So these are the input combinations. So you, you look at the function output. Output is true, meaning one, only for these five input combinations. So I can easily express this function as an or of these min terms, right? And that's the simple idea. That's it. I've given you the idea, basically. The function can be easily expressed as an or of this min term, 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 meaning if any of these min terms is true, the function evaluates the truth. Makes sense, right? So let's write that. So these are the truth table uh, entries, inputs, three input function, as you can see, uh, that lead to a one output at the end, five of them. I just copied from here to here. Now let's express them in terms of these variables. That's it, basically. So a function is true if a bar b c is true, or a b bar c bar is true, or a b bar c is true, or a b c bar is true, or a b c is true. I just defined you the function. So it's very easy to express by just looking at each of these min terms. And you need to, of course, express when this min terms becomes true. This min term becomes true if a is 0, b is 1, and c is 1. That's when this term gets activated over here, right? This min term, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this line becomes true if A is one, B is zero and C is zero. Okay, you can keep doing the same thing, but essentially by just looking at the truth table, you can express the function this way. I think this may be obvious to many of you, but this is really the canonical standard form 
you start with because it includes every single variable in every term, as you can see, right? Every term is equal in the number of variables it contains. And that's going to help us develop uh, methods to actually operate on these expressions uh, in a, let's say, nice and methodical way. Is this clear? Okay, good. Okay, so let's quickly go over it, what we did. Each row in the truth table has a min term. There are eight min terms over here, as you can see, for a three input function. If the function had a thousand inputs, there would be two to the one thousand, two to the, the one thousand. Two to the 1,000 min terms. Uh, and then a min term is a product and of literals. We discussed literals earlier. Each min term is true for that row, for this row basically, and only that row, clearly, because this min term is completely separate from this min term. They describe different, let's say, expressions. And all Boolean equations can be written this, in this SOP form. So if this function was a bit different, it would have a different SOP or sum of products form. And that's the idea. I think we've covered it. Why does it work? Hopefully, it's obvious why it works because, uh, let's see, the function evaluates to true. In other words, the output is one. If any of the products, any of the min terms, causes the output to be one, that's why we have an OR function over here. The, the result of the function is one if any of these is true, any of these uh, min terms is true. Okay, let's, let's see one example. If your inputs are 101, one, this min term gets activated. Uh, and as a result, uh, this shaded product term is, becomes one and no other product terms will turn on. None of them will, every, every other term will become zero. It's kind of obvious again, uh, because these are completely independent of each other, orthogonal to each other. So if inputs ABC correspond to a product term in the expression, then you get one of these min terms activated. So you get a one in the output. But if you have inputs ABC that do not correspond to any term in the expression, meaning if you have inputs zero, 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 for example, this evaluates to completely zero because none of the terms is activated because of the way you constructed it, right? That's the idea. So you can prove it clearly, but hopefully it's obvious. So now we've defined one of the canonical representations. And now we can actually agree on some things. Uh, let's talk about standard notation, shorthand notation. So if we agree on the order of the variables in the rows of the truth table, then we can enumerate each row with the decimal number that corresponds to the binary number created by the input pattern. Now, what does that mean? This is a mouthful. So let's agree that this is the order of variables, A, B, C. And we always start with 0, 0, 0, and we keep adding. We keep, we keep incrementing binary, right? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. You see what, what's happening over here. Uh, you basically increment in binary to get to, uh, next, to get to the next row. This way, we kind of agreed on the variables, A, B, C. That's the order. And truth table is specified this way, not some, in some random order, let's say. Now. You can see that this is decimal four, one zero zero. Uh, the input combination one zero zero is decimal four. So we call this min term four. This is zero zero zero, so we call this min term zero. This is zero zero one, so we call this min term one. And this is decimal seven, so that's min term seven. So we can express the function as a sum of products of these min terms. So this function is the same as m three, m four, m five, m six, m seven. Makes sense, right? We just agreed on some notation here. Or you can use the summation uh, notation, which you're going to see over here. That's the sum function of the min terms, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so if I throw you this three input function, if I tell you three, if this is a three input function, if I give you this expression, you know exactly what the truth table is because we agreed on many things here. Makes sense, right? And in the exam, you may see actual things like this. I mean, I'm not kidding, but this is the, this is, I, would, I would argue that this is an easy, these are easy questions. Okay, so this is basically what we did. These are the min terms. So because we agreed on these things, for a three input function, you know exactly what are the min terms and what do they correspond to over here. And a machine can, machine can also easily understand this clearly. Uh, why, this, why is this moving? Okay, so F in canonical form looks like this basically, as you can see, you can express it like this. And you can clearly understand that it corresponds to this function, which we have seen earlier. But remember that canonical form is not minimal form. Then someone, potentially a machine, goes and applies Boolean, uh, Boolean transformations, right? And I'm not going to do this here. Clearly, it's shown over here. You can apply some transformations to this function. And then you can keep doing this. And then you can see that this canonical representation is not a minimal form, clearly. The minimal form of this function is actually a plus b c, and it requires only two gates, two two input gates. This is basically a or b and c. b and c is here, 
or with eight. That's the function. If you had to implement using all of this, that would be a lot more gates, as you can see, right? But we didn't do that. We use this canonical form to really understand the function and you apply transformations so that we get to a simpler form. Does that make sense? Okay, later we, are, we will actually see how to apply transformations without looking at Boolean equations. But and at the end of this lecture, which we're not going to cover, there's a visual way of representing functions by looking at truth tables, you can actually figure out how to apply these transformations easily in a visual way. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not, I don't have time to cover those. These are called Carnot maps or K-maps. That's an interesting way of reducing functions, a visual way. I like it actually, but we don't have time to cover it. And it's, it's kind of nice as for humans to use, but it's not nice for machines to use. Machines usually use the uh, equations over here. Okay, so basically the point is, sum of products forms leads to two-level logic. Two-level logic, what does that mean? You have AND gates and then OR gates. Right. Basically, you have uh, three AND gates in this case, and uh, I guess one OR gate that ORs all of them. Let's take a look at that. This is the logic, basically. You have three AND gates to generate the min terms, and then one OR gate to OR all of them. And clearly, you need to uh, generate the literals, A as well as A bar, and for all of the input variables, too. So this is a function, a different function, expressed in sum of products form. Only three of the min terms are, uh, are present over here, as you can see. I can guess what they are. This is 0, 0, 0, for example. This is M0. Uh, and then uh, this is the implementation of the function directly in sum of products form, I would say. And, but this is not the minimal implementation. This is kind of the maximal implementation without too much redundancy, because you're, this, is, uh, this is a standardized form. Uh, I don't want to call it the maximal uh, logic because you can always add more logic, right? If you if there's no max, there's an add to end to maximum. You can still implement the same function by adding more and more logic. That Boolean expressions allow you that. But this is a maximal form that's not unreasonable, let's say, because you're really using terms that are completely independent of each other, as you can see. But they can still be reduced. Okay. So yeah, I don't know. Basically, SOP form does not directly lead to minimal logic. We'll see later to minimize this actually. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, hopefully everything was clear, but uh, any one bit function can be represented as a sum of products. A product is a Boolean end that includes all input variables of the function. This is called a min term. Somehow, okay, somehow it's not working very well. The one, in, one bit output of the function can be represented as the sum of all min terms that lead to a one in the output. And logically, this means that the function evaluates to true. Uh, in other words, the output is one. If any of the products or any of the min terms cause the output to be one. And SOP form in the end represents the function as a sum or of products or min terms that cause the output to be one. Basically, I repeated everything I said earlier just for redundancy purposes. Okay, so let's talk about the alternative canonical form. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it uh, because you can actually derive this easily as a De Morgan of the sum of products of the inverse of the function. But I, I want to give you intuition. Basically, here you find all the input combinations. They're unfortunately called max terms. I didn't invent this terminology. People use it. There's a reason for it, but we don't need to go into it. Uh, but basically, max terms for which the output of the function is false. So what do I mean for, uh, by this? Let's take a look at the same function. This is the same function we looked at and we expressed as sum of products form. We're not going to look at the output uh, when it's one. We're going to look at the output when it's zero and express it in terms of the max terms that lead to that zero output. So these are the rows we're going to look at. And you can, by just looking at these rows, you can express this function like this. This function leads to a zero if any of these max terms lead to a zero. And this is the max term expression, basically. So how does this lead to a zero? You can see that this leads to a zero this way. OK, so that's why this are, these are called sums and products, right? These are the sums. Uh, each sum can lead to a zero or one, but for the function to become a zero, any sum, any of these sums uh, should be a zero. And why? Because this is product. That's the end, basically. So, okay, each sum term represents one of the zeros of the function, as you can see. And the function evaluates the fourth. In other words, the output is zero if any of the sums cause the output to be zero. And you can verify this, basically. You can basically look at uh, this, fun uh, this becomes zero only if A, B, C are all zeros. This becomes zero if A and B are zeros and C is one. And this becomes zero if A and C are zeros and B is one. Makes sense, right? 
You can verify this uh, on your own also if this was too quick. And clearly, this input activates that term, and only the shaded sum term will equal zero for that input, and you'll get uh, this result in the end. And anything ended with zero, zero, as a result, the output of the function will be zero. Okay, so let's, let's consider another input over here, zero, one, zero. And this was the function as we expressed it. If you get this input, these are the, uh, let's say, uh, if you plug in zero, one, zero for A, B, and C, these are, this is what you would get. And essentially you would or these because these are the products and you would end these because this, uh, you would have a sum of the products in the end and the function evaluates to zero as expected. And only one of the products will be zero and anything ended with zero is zero as we discussed earlier. Therefore the output is zero. I think these are very basic. That's why I'm going through this relatively quickly. Once, in my opinion, actually, I like sum of products form better because I like thinking of a function being true and any of the, up, any of the min terms being true. And if you want to derive a product of sums after that, you can basically take the De Morgan of the uh, complement uh, of uh, the function, uh, complement of the SOP, SOP basically. And we will see also how, how to translate it. So if that was not clear, this is, this is the De Morgan of the SOP of uh, F bar. Okay, so how do you write the uh, product of some form? Uh, let's take a look at it. Uh, I think we already did this. You, you, you do the same exercise except for rows that are zero in the output. Find the truth table where the uh, output is zero. And uh, you look at uh, each of these variables, A, B, C. If you have a zero, you use a true literal, which is A. If you have a one in the input column, then you get the complemented result. For example, for this C, we use C bar, right? And this makes sense. You should think about it. And you order the literals to get a max term. So for example, this is zero, 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 you or the ABC. This is zero, one, zero, the third one. You or A, B bar, uh, and C, as you can see over here. And then and together all the max terms, corresponding to three different uh, zeros over here. And that's how you get it basically in the end. Okay, and this is stop. Or as I said, just remember, pos of S is the same as the De Morgan of SOP of F bar. Basically, if this is given to you, what you can do is you can transform this function uh, and get the De Morgan of SOP of F bar. Uh, you, you first figure out the, uh, the sum of products form of F bar, which is essentially the complemented part over here, and then take the De Morgan of that. And hopefully you know how to do that by now. Okay, so again, you can agree on the notation, just like we did for the min terms. You basically express these as max terms for each entry in a truth table and input truth table. Every uh, entry, uh, every input combination can be expressed as a max term, as you can see over here. And if you agree on the order, you can say this is max term zero, max term one, max term two, dot, dot, dot. And then this function can be expressed as uh, the product of sums of max terms 0, 1, 2. This was a function we examined earlier. Right? And once someone throws this at you, you know exactly what the truth table looks like, right? Because you agreed on the order again. Okay, let me talk about a couple of things. I mean, we, we talked about this already, so I'm going to skip that. But note that this is not the complement of the function. So the same function for which we formed the sum of products form earlier, we're forming the product of sums form. Are, these are not complements. These are two different canonical representations of the exact same function. The complement of the function is, if you, basically you put F bar over here, and that's the complement. It should be one, 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 zero, 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 zero in the outputs uh, in each row over here. So let's talk about some useful conversions very quickly. Again, these are obvious if you know Boolean algebra, or if you just think a little bit, uh, if you want to convert a function from a min term form to max term form, Basically, uh, this is, for example, the function that we examined. This is the min term expansion form, sum of products uh, three, four, five, six, seven. It's the same as product of sums that are remaining, the indices, uh, min ter max terms that are not used, basically. You can do max term to min term conversion exactly the same way. Product, uh, uh, yeah, product of sums, uh, max terms with zero, one, two is equal to sum of products, uh, max, uh, min terms three, four, five, six, seven. You can complement things. Complement is actually, uh, as we discussed, it's the true complement of the function. If someone gives you a min term expression of a function, the complement is essentially the min term expression of uh, the min terms that you do not use. 
So it really is some of the mint terms that did, you did not use in this mint term expression. And this makes sense, right? Because you're looking at the complements. Complements should have all of the other mint term turned on, one, and every mint term that are expressed here not turned on, zero. Okay, and you can also uh, say that this is uh, the product of sums. We already based on this equality. And you do the same thing for product of sums. Okay, I don't want to go through all of this because I think it's obvious, actually. I don't want to spend a lot of time because we want to go into combinational logics as well, uh, combinational logic circuits as well, uh, with di different building blocks. Uh, but you can study these on your own and convince yourself that this is true. I think this is true because based, we know that uh, one form is the De Morgan of uh, the uh, fun a function bar of the other form. Right? Okay, so let's talk about logic. Simple. Any, any questions so far? I, think, I know I've gone through relatively quickly and repeated myself multiple times, but this, should, this is really a lot of, let's say, in my opinion, easy stuff, right? Uh, you, can, you can think logically and you can figure out all of this on your own, actually. Uh, Boole figured out in 1840s and 1830s uh, and wrote this beautiful book, The Mathematical Analysis of Logic. And I think we have progressed a lot since then. But basically, we can simplify the sum of products and product of sums form in a very methodical way. That's why we've been doing this. You start with the canonical forms, and this enables convenience and automation. You start with truth table, derive the SOP or POS form, or maybe sometimes you don't even start with the truth table. You start with the SOP POS form and use Boolean simplification rules to simplify. Many heuristics, many rules, many axioms, or some other heuristics that we will discuss later on. For example, uh, we, will also, we will soon discuss, we will later in this lecture discuss a full one-bit adder, uh, and we're going to start with the truth table, and we're going to simplify it to these equations, basically. These are clearly not sum of products or products of some forms, right? Because it's a three input function, A, B, C, and sum is A, X, or B, X, or C, and carry out is the majority function of A, B, and C, as we have discussed earlier. But we're going to derive this uh, later on in this lecture. Make sense? How many people have seen full adders before? Okay. In what course? Or was the course, or have you read, have you done the readings? Okay, people have done the readings. That's good. It's good that if, you, if you're doing the readings, then a lot of this is going to become more clear, frankly. Okay, so this is the simplification example. We've seen this function earlier, sum of product form of this function that I just made up, three min terms, as you can see. And this is what happens if you directly implement the sum of products form. You form the min terms, each of the three min terms using AND gates and the NOT gates over here, and or uh, the function. Uh, or the min terms so that you get the output bits over here. And if you want to simplify it, well, as I said, this doesn't, this is not minimal logic. If you want to simplify it, you can use Boolean simplification rules. I'm not going to do that, but your book does that. Well, your book does that actually. So you can, this is a direct example from your book. You can find that if, if you don't, if you're not convinced that this actually is the minimal form of this, you should do some Boolean algebra or look at your book. And your book basically, uh, basically, this is the minimal form. And you can see that this doesn't have min terms over here. So there's an interesting observation here that's uh, going to be important maybe later on. What I've kind of shown you is that this sum of product form can express any function, right? That also means that you can implement any function using nots, and, and or gates. This is very interesting, right? Any function can be expressed as a truth table, any one, uh, one bit function. If you want to do another bit, of course, you have another uh, OR gate over here, as we will see later on. Uh, but basically, any one bit function can be expressed as uh, the sum of products or product of sums form. And clearly, sum of product or products of sum form can be expressed using only with NOTs and, and OR gates. And this is the no notion of Boolean completeness or functional completeness. Basically, and or and not gates is functionally complete or Boolean complete. You can implement any one bit function using them and you can generalize it to n bits later on. We're gonna see that later on. It turns out this is not the, uh, let's say minimal uh, requirement for Boolean completeness. You don't have to have uh, all of these types of gates. You can just get away with an and and not because of the Morgan, you can think about it. The Morgan actually, you can implement an OR using AND and NOT, right? The Morgan is very useful, the Morgan's laws. Uh, that's how you prove actually functional completeness equivalence also. But basically, if you have only AND and NOT, that's also functionally complete. If you have only OR and NOT, that's also functionally complete. So you can basically express this 
using only and and not and or and not and any function as well. So I think that's very interesting. And this is something uh, we will talk about later on when we talk about a particular combinational logic block called programmable, programmable logic array. Did that make sense? Anybody? Okay, so people are doing this. If, if that didn't make sense, you will actually have another opportunity to see that soon. But the key takeaway is any function can be expressed using sum of products and products of some form in a way, in a way everybody agrees on, basically. And then that means that any function can be implemented using and, or, and not gates. Okay, now let's cover some basic com combinational blocks. I mean, you, you may be asking me, okay, we've been covering some combinational blocks. What do I mean? Let's actually cover some combination blocks that build upon what we have done so far. And these are what will, what will be used in uh, modern computers. Clearly we've seen these, but now we're gonna actually uh, make them more bigger, let's say. Usually you, whenever you design a system, you don't always look at the system. For example, if I have this chip, uh, I have the logic layout, lo logic blocks of this chip. I don't just look at the inverters and gates or gates. I want to group them into broader modules. For example, I want to say this is memory or, and the memory can be consist of, consisting of decoders, uh, uh, selectors, as we will see, MUXs, and the memory array, for example. Basically, I, I want to increase the granularity of the module so that I can make sense of what I'm looking at. If I was just looking at a sea of gates, maybe I cannot make sense, right? Because uh, I, I don't understand uh, immediately what it looks like. So I want to build larger blocks to build complex systems and make sense of complex systems. So if I, uh, this, this is what this census means. I have gate level details. If, I, if, if all I had was just gate level, then I wouldn't understand necessarily what the block was doing, right? I mean, I could, if I, if I spent a lot of time just looking at the gates, I could, of course, figure out what the block is doing, right? This is not magic. This is Boolean logic in the end. If somebody gave me 114 billion transistors and only the gates, even the transistors, right? If you, by just looking at the transistors, you can figure out the functionality. But that's a lot of work. So that's why we built higher level modules. And then we look, we basically specify, oh, this is a decoder. Underlying gate level implementation, I don't care. Or maybe somebody cares, or maybe I cared at some point, but now this is the decoder I built. This is a multiplexer, this is the adder, this is a PLA, as we will see. So we will see these logic blocks that are very common in existing processors that are used to build the entire system. And we're gonna present them with modules as we will see, but we're also, look going, to, we're also ex going to examine their gate level implementations based on what we have seen earlier. Okay, let's take a look at decoder. How many people have seen decoder before? Okay, people who've done the readings probably. How many people had seen a decoder before, before doing the readings? Okay, very few people. That's what I expected, that's good. That's why you're here, partially. So decoder does what it does, it decodes basically. If you have some information, uh, it basically figures out what that pattern What's the pattern in that information is? That's what a decoder is essentially. You can also think of this as an input pattern detector. We're gonna look at a very specific type of decoder, but you can build very sophisticated decoders based on the specific type of decoder that we will discuss. Basically you have N inputs and two to the N outputs. And I'm just uh, going to describe this functionally. Uh, the results looks like, the truth table looks like, exactly one of the outputs is one and the rest are zeros for a given input. Make sense? Meaning the output that is logically one is the output that's corresponding to the input pattern that the logic circuit is expected to detect. Okay, what does this mean, right? So let's say you have a two to four decoder. This is what the truth table is. So what does a two to four decoder mean? It has two inputs and it has four outputs. Two inputs are bits A1 and A0. You can think of this one bit here and another bit over here. And then outputs are four bit output over here four different outputs, y3 to y0. So what is this decoder expected to do? This decoder is expected to distinguish between each of the inputs. And that's what it's doing, basically. If the inputs are zero and zero, only one of the outputs, y0 is one, everything else is zero. Okay, so this is how we distinguish between uh, from uh, zero and zero. If the input is zero and one, only one of the outputs, y1 is one, and everything else is zero. And y1 is different from y0, as you can see. You're distinguishing zero, zero input from zero, one input by enabling another, a different output to be one. If the input is one, zero here, only one of the inputs, y2 is one, and everything else is zero. Again, y2 is different from y1 and y0. And if the input is one, one, 
only one of the outputs, y3 is one, everything else is zero. So now you can see why this is a decoder. We have, we have essentially four possible combinations of the input pattern. So if you have two input function like this, you have four possible combinations of the inputs. And you need to have outputs that are corresponding to all of those possible combinations. And a different output bit is one based on which input pattern is applied. You basically decode it. If you, if you look at the output over here, you, you basically say that this is zero, zero. Makes sense, right? OK, so this is how we express it in a module level. So basically, if, if the output is 1, you, you, you can say that inputs are 0, 0. If y3 is 1, you can say that a1 and a0 are both 1. That's what decoding means. So this is the module level expression. I'm, we're going to look at the gate level implementation. Uh, we're going to take a break after we finish decoder, and then we're going to start with multiplexers. Uh, but basically, you can see that uh, this doesn't tell me uh, anything of the gate level implementation. There are actually multiple ways of implementing decoder at the gate level. But I'd like to think of decoder as a function. And I don't want to look at the gate level details, as you can see. So it's a two input, four output function. And I know exactly what it implements. It implements this uh, truth table. OK, now let's take a look at the gate level details. This is exactly what I said. The output that is logically one is the output that's corresponding to the input pattern that the logic search is expected to detect. And this is the gate level. This is one gate level implementation of the decoder module. And you can convince yourself that what I wrote over here is true. Basically, you have two input function. These are actually the min terms in this case, which is very interesting. Uh, decoder is actually uh, taking all the min terms and distinguishing between min terms. That's one function of uh, the decoder, actually. You can think of it that way. We're going to see the decoder used later in a programmable logic array. OK. But ignore that for now. You can see that uh, if a, a and B are both zeros, this is a one, and everything else is zero. If A is zero and B is one, this is a one, and everything else is zero. And you can basically keep doing this. Basically, only one output is one, corresponding to the input pattern that output is uh, that output uh, that that gate is detecting over here. And this is a very simple decoder. You can say, okay, it's obvious. So here, for example, if A is one, B is zero, this is uh, this output is one, and all of the other outputs are zero. Makes sense. So you may ask, what, what are we going to use this for? And we will see that. Basically, it's useful for uh, determining how to interpret a bit pattern. When is this useful? Uh, well, I think this is one bit pattern over here. For example, the bit pattern could be the address of a location in memory. Remember, this Apple M1 Ultra has 128 gigabytes of memory, right? 128 gigabytes is 2 to the 37 bytes. Assuming that your address is 37, uh, it's 2 to the 37, right? Yes, I think 2 to the 37. Assuming uh, basically your address is 37 bits. Let's assume that your address is 37 bits. Every single byte needs to have a unique address. And if you want to figure out which bytes that you want to get from a processor, you have a 37 input decoder. Uh, and that leads to 2 to the 37 outputs. Makes sense, right? 37 bit decoder basically each, uh, and you have two to the 37 outputs. So have, building these bigger and bigger memories re relies on you to have bigger and bigger decoders, as we will see tomorrow also actually. So this is one use of the decoder. You have a, a bit pattern that specifies the address of a location. Which location is it? And these, uh, these outputs will be actually enabling those locations, enabling the only location that you're interested in basically. Okay, another thing. Uh, you have a bit pattern that encodes an instruction. You have this bit pattern, and there may be many instructions. We will see this actually in five, uh, actually five lectures, yes, lecture 10, maybe lecture 9 also. Uh, we will see the instructions at architecture. To communicate between a program and the hardware, you need to specify what the instruction does. Is it an add? Is it an end? Is it a multiply? Is it a divide? Is it a square root? So there are hundreds of instructions, right? How does the processor figure out what instruction it is? There's a bit pattern. Encoding. It's called the encoding of the instruction. And you basically decode that encoding using essentially a circuit that looks like this. It could be the instruction of the program. And based on the opcode, as we will see, that's the opcode is the instruction encoding, instruction opcode. We figure out what instruction it is using a decoder, just like this. You can think of a decoder as a bit pattern detector. You have a bit pattern, you have to decode it. That's the idea. OK, so this is a great time to actually take a break. Uh, and then we will start with multiplexer.
But don't forget the decoder because we're going to get back to it. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Jim, just before I, sure. um, you, don't, you don't speak German, do you? I mean, very little. I, I, don't, I don't think I, I would be very comfortable with it, frankly, uh, <laughs> especially in technical terms. I'm really terrible. I have 5.40 in the morning. <laughs> wow, that's a lot. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, I watched the Cerebras uh, intro. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. How do we have to imagine data to improve computation? Mm -hmm. As in the way the data is coming in dictates what needs to be done to it. Uh, you can think of it that way. Yes, we will see actually a form of it. He was talking about data flow computing, for example, right? Yes. Uh, when the data flows, uh, so in, in modern computers, you're, you basically have instructions, right? Oh, okay. And they cache, the, they, uh, they decide what data should be come. You can think of data driven computing as you yeah. have data coming in, and the data decides which instruction oh. can execute. Oh. Because uh, they, uh, they, data somehow decides which is try, able try. to get at this point because not all instructions try. can execute if the data is not ready. That's the idea, basically. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Dish full. Dish full. Dish full. Dish full. Dish so that's a good question. I think, uh, I mean, they, he didn't go into a lot of detail uh, in that, but I believe what it does is uh, one node does multiplication and sends it to another node, uh, the intermediate results, which adds to it another multiplication. So I'll th I think they're doing multiply and accumulate in each node. I think so, yeah. I don't remember exactly what he mentioned, but he didn't go into the circuit, uh, the, the detail implementation right now. Sure. Yeah, that's my feeling also. I, I don't think they really go into a lot of detail uh, in any of their documentation. Let me do one thing over here. Yeah. So
Yeah, maybe. Uh, all right. I should give it. Yeah, since we have a lot to cover, I don't want to waste any time. So hopefully you're now comfortable with the decoder. Uh, we're going to see decoder more today and tomorrow and in later lectures. So I get familiar with it. But let me talk about multiplexer. This is also a very common uh, combination logic block that's used all over the process, as you will also see. You'll, you'll also see it tomorrow. This is also called a selector or MUX. I like the term selector because it's very simple. <laughs> okay, maybe that was a multiplexer, I don't know. Maybe it's multiplexing music. Uh, but basically, uh, multiplexer selects one of the M, N inputs. It has N inputs, and it selects one of the N inputs and connects it to the output. So it has N inputs and one output. And the selection is done based on a control input called select input that specifies which one to select and pass it to the output. And this control input is locked to the n bits, uh, yeah, as you will see. For example, if you have a two to one max, you have two data inputs, you have one select input, and you have one output. Max always has one output. It could be multi-bit outputs, in this case, one bit output, but you're basically, uh, the task of the max is to select either this data zero bit or data one input based on the value of select. So you can actually see what's happening over here. If select is zero, y is equal to d zero. If select is one, y is equal to d one. And that's it. By just seeing that pattern, you can actually minimize this logic, as you can see. And this is our higher level representation of a multiplexer or a selector. You have two inputs, two data inputs, two to one selector. Data zero, data one, and a select input. And y is equal to D0, if select input is zero, y is equal to D1, if select input is one. Simple, right? So why could this be useful? This could be useful, uh, for example, when you're getting, when you need data from potentially different places. You may get the data from a keyboard or from main memory in an instruction. And you can select based on some input, right? If the user actually hit the keyboard, you can actually get the data into the computer using, uh, well, if the user hit the keyboard, for example, uh, the select input may be one, and the data from the keyboard can be selected and supplied to some particular register in the process, as we will see later on. Okay, this is one example. There are many, many other examples, as we will see when we build logic uh, blocks. Okay, so this is the underlying implementation. One potential gate level realization of a two to one max selector. Uh, you can see that there's one select line that's connected to N gates consisting uh, whose other inputs are the data lines, A and B. And if select line is zero, this input at, the, uh, at this N gate will be one because there's a complement as you can see, and A will pass over here. And if select line is zero, this input will be zero. So zero will pass over here and A ord with zero is the output. So you can see this is an AND gate and this is an OR gate. So let's take a look at it. I mean, I, I've already done this for you, actually. If S is zero, the output is A. And you can convince yourself that this F is, S is one, the output is B. Makes sense, right? This is, again, basic logic. We're building a multiplexer based on AND, NOT, and OR gate. And remember, bubble is always a NOT. OK. And you can convert it to different gates, of course. There is another implementation. There are many implementations of a multiplexer. You don't have to build this this way. This is actually, the, in my opinion, the simplest logical implementation of it. Okay. I mean, I, I already said this, I think. The output C is always connected to either input A or input B. Output value depends on the value of the select line S. And this is another representation of the max. Usually, you can see this representation. It's always nicer to actually have a zero input and one input over here, basically. It's good to specify whether you select A when S is zero or you select B when S to zero, right? But you can figure that out from the truth table over here. This is like, let's say abstract truth table of a max, right? Uh, basically, it doesn't 
it's kind of a messed up truth table because it doesn't really list all the inputs. You have three inputs in a max, max A, B, and S. But this is kind of a cute way of representing a truth table uh, by just using S as the input and the other inputs are kind of at the output, right? If S is zero, C is A. If S is one, C is B. This is not the truth table you should start with if you're doing a, a, a product of sums or a sum of product form. But this is a cute way of, let's say, messing with your truth table so that you can represent a, represent a max. Okay, so your task, actually, I'm going to do this task, part of this task, but you will have it, you already have it in your homework, I think. And homeworks are optional. We're not going to grade them, but they're a great way for you to actually learn the material. So I would definitely recommend doing them for learning as well as for pre preparing for the exam. Basically, draw the schematic for a four input, four to one max. You can do it using gate level as a combination of basic and or not gates, or you can do it as module level as a combination of two input maxes. So remember, this is the gate level, two to one max, and this is the module level, two to one max. And I'm going to show you actually how you design a four to one max based on both. Well, this is it basically. So four to one multiplexer. Remember, multiplexer has n inputs and one output, and log two to the n select lines. So here we have four inputs, d0 to d3, one output y, and two select lines, s0 and s1. And you can see that these, each of them, each of these modules is a two to one multiplex, right? So y, y takes the value of d0 if s0 is zero and f1 is, s1 is zero, as you can see. You can convince yourself because this multiplexer will select d0 and the second multiplexer will select the, uh, select the input at the top if s1 is zero. Then you get d0 at the end if s2 and s, s0 and s1 are both zero. Makes sense, right? So you can basically convince yourself that there's a four to one multiplexer built using two to one multiplexers. And this, this over here means that it's also S0. Basically S0 selects between the first level, uh, between D0, D1, and D2, D3. And S1 selects between whatever is coming out of the first level multiplexer. So by using three two to one multiplexers, you can build a four to one multiplexer. And you can count the gates uh, that you have if you actually do that. I'm not. I'm not going to do that, but by looking at the two to one multiplexer, you have three gates plus one inverter over here, right? Or you can directly build the four to one multiplexer, which is this. This is a four to one multiplexer over here. Uh, again, you can convince yourself that if S1 and S0 are both zeros, this AND gate will pass D0, and all of the other AND gates will be all zeros. So you get D0 at the output. So you can build a four to one multiplexer using four AND gates and one OR gate, but these are wider AND and OR gates. So you can see that these are three inputs, AND gates and a four input OR gate, right? The beauty of this is you're using only two input gates. Unfortunately, I have to go back. Remember, these are all two input gates. So if you actually use, uh, could you derive a four to one multiplexer using Two to one multiplexers like this. Yes, you have, I think, three gates here, three gates here, three gates, nine gates here, and three inverters, I believe. Yes, 12 gates if you actually combine all of them. Maybe you look like you have more gates, but here you have gates that are wider, meaning potentially slower gates. Remember the transistor level? We don't want to go a lot into transistor level, but a lot, if you have a lot of inputs, uh, the gates will be slower. Right? So that's the trade off you see over here. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions? This is clear. What multiplexer does? It selects one of the inputs, basically, based on the uh, select lines. One of the data inputs based on the select lines. OK, so based on this, you can hopefully figure out how to build an 8 to 1 multiplexer. right? An 8 to 1 multiplexer is essentially, uh, you can have this, you can have another copy of it, and you can have another multiplexer at the end. So it's very easy to build. Uh, multiplexer trees, if you will. And if you have a 16 to 1 multiplexer, you, mul you copy an 8 to 1 multiplexer to the side and add another 2 to 1 multiplexer at the end. Right? Or you can keep doing this. Basically, you can keep adding, uh, you, can, you can keep enlarging your AND gates and the OR gates, but at some point, the gates may not be easy to build. So it's good to keep this in mind. Multiplexers are nice. Okay, let me actually take it aside because I think this is really interesting since you're going to be programming FPGAs. And since we, when we talked about FPGAs, we talked about lookup tables. You can do, you can do log using multiplexers as well. 
uh, meaning they can be used as lookup tables to perform logic functions. And that's what your FPGAs are essentially doing. So let's take a look at one example. So this is your truth table, and hopefully you're familiar with it. This is an AND uh, function. So Y is AND of A and B, as you can see. And this is a multiplexer implementation of it, a four to one multiplexer. Now, what does this mean? Basically, Y is equal to one only if uh, the inputs A and B are one. Basically, you're using A and B as select lines and you're wiring all possible combinations of A and B. Remember, you have two select lines, meaning you have two to the two data lines. You're representing essentially the truth table as a multiplex over here. That's the idea, basically. You formulate the truth table as a multiplexing by having the inputs as select lines, output as output line, and by wiring the data inputs to what the output should be based on the inputs. So if the output, for example, if A and B are both zero, output should be zero. If A and B are zero, one, or one, zero, output should be zero, so you wire them to zeros. That's what the ground means. And the output should be one if A and B are both ones. You wire them to uh, the high logic level over here. That's what that means. If you remember the transistor uh, that we saw earlier. But you can think of this zero, 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 and one also. So that's the idea. This is beautiful, right? Now we've just implemented an AND gate using a multiplex. Who would do that? Not many people in the world because you could do an AND gate easily without requiring a multiplexer, right? Yeah, but we can implement much more complicated functions also, as we will see. This is just the basics. Does this make sense? Okay, great. So another example of AND gate using a multiplexer, you can simplify this multiplexer, right? So basically by looking at the truth table, this is the AND gate, and this is how you can simplify it, right? You can play some tricks. Uh, basically, Y is equal to uh, zero. Uh, so if A is zero, Y is equal to zero. If A is one, Y is equal to B. You can actually do that by taking a look at how these functions operate, right? And I'm gonna let you do that yourself over here. So by realizing this is the same as B, uh, and by realizing that uh, this is the same as A, uh, you can, and A is equal to zero in this particular case, and B changes in this case. So that's, what, that's how you can actually simplify this multiplex. This is equivalent to this. And they both implement the end function. This is a bit cheaper, of course, right now, because it's a two to one multiplex. But it's still not as cheap as an AND gate. So this is not what we would like to do in the end. You don't want to implement an AND function using a multiplexer, but you can do it. That's the whole point. This is another example. Here's an XOR function, which is more sophisticated using a multiplexer. This is basically A XOR B, and this is the truth table representation of it. Remember, XOR function evaluates to one if an odd number of inputs is one, evaluates to zero otherwise. And you can see that. Uh, that's the case over here. Now let's simplify it, right? Basically, y is equal to b if a is zero by just looking at it, uh, by observing patterns over here. The, number, uh, the, the values of y, the output, is equal to b over here if a is equal to zero. And the values of y is the complement of b if a is equal to one. This is how you can simplify this particular truth table. Again, you create a warped truth table. And, but this is very nice for a multiplexer, right? Uh, you can implement this using a multiplexer. Y is equal to B if A is equal to zero. Y is equal to B bar if A is equal to one. And then you connect B and B bar over here as the inputs of the multiplexer. And this is not a bad uh, way of implementing uh, XOR actually, because XOR tends to be uh, more hardware intensive. And this is getting, even the multiplexer implementation is still expensive, but it's not bad. Does this make sense? Okay, so again, what we're doing is Boolean logic, simple Boolean logic, but we're playing some tricks. You, again, you can think of this as a lookup table, right? What we're looking up. Basically, uh, you have two potential things you select from, B and B bar, and A selects from B, uh, A, A basically selects which one becomes the output. You're looking up based on A, what the output value should be, and that lookup table implements the function A XOR B. Okay, let's take a look at a more sophisticated function. I'm not gonna minimize this one, but you can find it in your, uh, uh, in your book also. Basically, this is the, uh, well, this is the minimized version. Actually, I, can't, I, don't, I don't wanna say this is the minimal form. I think this is the minimal form, but I'm not sure. I didn't really do the 
uh, minimization. But this is a function. You can express this like this. This is a truth table. And any function for which you have a truth table, you can directly implement that truth table using this multiplexing. This is clearly a large form, right? This is a, you have eight inputs, uh, sorry, you have three inputs, meaning eight possible different values the function can take. And what the, what the multiplexer will do is based on the values of the inputs, it will select one of those eight possible values the function can take, right? Does that make sense? So for example, if the select inputs are A, B, C, are all, I'm gonna pick one, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, then Y will be one. And you can basically, uh, you can basically see how we can construct this multiplexer very easily as a lookup table. Based on the inputs, you select what the output should be by just forming the, expressing the, formulating the truth table as a multiplexer. Of course, this is again, a very large form. You prefer to minimize it and you can minimize it just like, for example, we did it over here. But this is a very general form. You can implement any function using, any uh, three input function using this multiplex by connecting uh, the appropriate values to the data inputs. That's why these are beautiful. You can program these, right? You can also think of these as, again, these are actually min terms of the function, right? Yeah, okay. So they recall the slides that we covered, that Atabak covered in the FPGA lecture. This was our multiplexer, basically, three input lookup table. You, it used a multiplexer. I'm not gonna go over this again. You've seen this, but now it makes sense, hopefully. A three input lookup table can implement any three input, three bit uh, input function because the multiplexer can implement that function. Okay, and FPGAs actually use six inputs or maybe larger sometimes, uh, uh, six bit inputs. So you, you can see that their lookup tables are much larger today. Okay, similarly to this, and also fascinatingly, but not surprisingly, you can use logic using decoders. You can implement logic using decoders. For example, decoders can be combined with OR gates to build logic functions. This is one example. Let's assume that this is the XNOR function. You want to implement the XNOR function. Well, here's how you can do it. You basically figure out what is XNOR. XNOR is really A, B, or A, B bar, or A bar, B bar, sorry, not A, B bar. Uh, a, B, or A bar, B bar, essentially. And a two to the four decoder provides the min terms of the function and you order. This is the two-level implementation that we saw actually for a truth table, a two-level SOP, sum of products implementation. So a decoder is really providing the min terms to you because what the decoder does is it takes two inputs. If it's a two input function, you have two, the two possible outputs and based on uh, a given input combination, only one of those outputs will be enabled. Remember, that's the same as a min term as we have seen in SOP. So decoder is really implementing the min term, assuming you give all the inputs of a function. And then you just need to OR uh, the outputs that are really need to be connected uh, to the OR gates, essentially the output, uh, in the sum of products form, the, uh, the min terms that need to appear in the sum of products form need to be OR. And this is beautiful, I think. You will see this actually, this is very similar to a programmable logic array as we will see in a little bit. Okay, any questions on this? I use this as an aside, but uh, it's a very powerful aside, uh, meaning you can do logic using multiplexers and decoders, even though these are functions that we built uh, based on logic gates, we can actually use, uh, construct any logic gates, uh, any logic function based on decoders and multiplexers as well. And these form the, uh, core of today's programmable, uh, today's uh, reconfigurable engines like FPGAs. Okay, so let's talk about full adder. Uh, this was fun. Uh, full adder is essentially we're going to do binary addition. All of you are very familiar with decimal addition. Are people are familiar with binary addition also? Okay, that's good. I think many people are familiar. I, I'll go through it quickly. But basically very similar to decimal addition, you do uh, addition bit by bit. So assume that these are n bits, two n bit numbers. You need to do the addition bit by bit and then generate a carry every time you do an addition. Okay, so you go from right to left, one column at a time. You, you generate one sum and one carry bit at every bit location you examine. So if you first add A0 and B0 bits, okay, and get sum zero and that generates a carry into the next level, carry one basically. And then initially the carry is zero actually because you don't have anything that generates a carry internally. So you can actually, you're really adding a zero, b zero, and zero, and that gives you some zero. 
and that generates a carry one. Now you add A1, B1, and carry one, that generates a sum one, and generates a carry two, and you keep doing this basically until you get the top bits that generates sum n minus one, and then carry out to n. Okay, so basically you can express one of these, one bit addition, A1, B1, C1, or AB, B0, C0, for example, uh, uh, on one column of bits within two n bit operands. So in this case, we're looking at one bit, right? So this is the truth table of one column over here. So A1, B1, and carry are the inputs, carry out, and sum is the uh, outputs. I said inputs, right? These are the outputs, uh, these are the inputs, and these are the two outputs. So it's a three input, two output function, as you can see. And clearly, you can, you can write this in some product form for each of the outputs, and then you can minimize this function. And we, will, we may do that later on. But basically, binary addition is n one bit additions over here. And let's, let's look at the SOP of one bit addition. I'm, I didn't write the SOP, some of products, so you can do it based on what we said. But for example, for carry uh, i plus one, uh, you, you, it's the sum of products of min terms, I guess zero, zero, one, two, three, five, six, seven. Min terms, three, five, six, seven, right? And the sum is min terms one, two, uh, five, oh no, zero, one, two, three, four, one, two, four, and seven. And you can clearly generate the truth table by your, yourself by doing the binary addition. I'm not going to do that. Let's, let's take one example. Let's do zero, one, one. Uh, if you add zero, one, one in binary, the sum is zero because the, the total is zero because the total is two actually, but in binary that's zero because you get two modulo, by, uh, two, modulo two, right? But you generate a carry because what you generate is actually more than what you can represent with a single bit. As a result, carry goes out. And this is, you can convince yourself that the, this, this row is true while generating the truth table. And then you can look at the sum of products form and implement in two level logic. This is the two level logic that implements the sum of products form. You can convince yourself that's the case. I think I looked at it and this is true. Uh, but basically, uh, what do I want to say here? So you can see that this is a classical sum of products form, right? Uh, um, okay. This is basically, I don't want to minimize it right now. We're going to minimize it later on. Uh, but uh, this is really a full adder. And you basically get rid of the sum of product form and say, this is a full adder that implements my function. Internally, we're going to minimize this later on. Or we can implement it actually as a PLA, as we will see. But this is not the minimal form. Minimal form we've actually seen earlier, right? Uh, the sum is really uh, the XOR and the carry is really uh, the uh, majority function. OK. And you can also see the majority function over here. For example, uh, carry is one if at least two of the inputs are one. And you can see that that's the majority function, right? All, uh, carry is one only in those inputs where at least two of the inputs of AI, BI, and carry I are actually one. Makes sense, right? OK, so that's our full adder. We're going to minimize this in a little bit, uh, but hold on until then. But let's build some bigger adders. So normally you have, you don't use one bit adders, right? You use four bit numbers, 16 bit numbers, 32 bit numbers, 64 bit numbers. The question is, how do you do that addition? This is a one bit adder. If you want to actually create a four bit adder, you, you have four, two four bit numbers. You basically chain four of these full adders. So uh, basically to add two four bit binary numbers, A and B, each binary number can be represented as B3 uh, through B0, you can see the bits, and A3 through A0, you can see the bits. You can add one bit at a time, basically. This is the addition of A0, B0. It generates a sum and it generates a carry. This is a full adder that implements this module. And essentially this truth table. Internally, it may look like this. This is the sum of product two level logic implementation. Okay. And Basically, you can see that the second full adder adds the second bit, bit one. The third full adder adds the bit two. And the last full adder adds bit three. Now, this is interesting, clearly. And this works correctly. And this is what it's doing, essentially. And you can actually convince yourself this works also. But this may be slow, right? Because for this adder to uh, finish the computation of this, this adder needs to finish computation. And for this adder to start computation, this adder needs to finish computation. And for this adder to start computation, this adder needs to finish computation. The way we design this in a rippling manner, this is also called a ripple carry adder, because it's rippling the carry, is serial. 
Now your execution is really serial. This last adder will get its input very late, relatively late. But this is one way of building an adder, and it's correct. If you want to actually extend it to 32 bits, this is what happens. This is another representation of the adder. You can see it in your book. Each of this is a full adder, one bit adder. And you can see that there are 32 adders over here. And this last adder is on the critical path. We're going to talk about timing in a few lectures. Right now, I don't want to deal with a lot of timing, but you can intuitively see that the, uh, the timing will be very slow. As you keep adding, it will take time for this address to finish the computation, and this will take a lot of time to finish. So as you expand the number of bits, you're, uh, the width of the bits you're adding to 64 bits, 128 bits, 256 bits, this adder becomes slower and slower and slower. It works correctly, but you need to give more time to it for, the, for it to give you the right output. But this is one way of building the adder and uh, start looking at section five if you want, if you're really interested in adders and other circuits, I'm gonna mention that in a little bit. This is not the only way of building the adder. This is a slow adder. If you really want to make the adder fast, you need actually a lot of thinking in terms of logic because you can actually construct that 32. Uh, well, in this case, the truth table is very large, right? You have two 32 bits and a C input. Uh, essentially, you have 65 bits truth table, 65 bits, uh, 65 input, and let's say 32, 33 output truth table, assuming C out and C in, this is an input and this is an output. So the truth table of this 32 bit adder is 65 bit input, 65 inputs, 32 outputs. Right. Makes sense, hopefully. By just looking at it, you can figure that out, figure out those numbers. Then you can actually start to create the sum of products form and product of sum form, whatever you, you're interested in, and then minimize that function. That's another way of building the adder. It's not this way. This is a different way. Here, we built a one-bit adder, optimize it potentially, and then combine them to build a 32-bit adder. That's a completely different way of starting from the truth table of a 32-bit adder and optimizing that truth table. That will lead to better logic, I will argue. But it's not modular logic. Then you have to actually create a different adder, a different logic realization of diff different n bit adders that you have in your system. There may be one bit adder, two bit adder, four bit adder, three bit adder, eight bit adder, 16 bit adder, 32 bit adder. You have different logic implementations of all of these adders as opposed to having a single modular implementation of a single bit adder and then using it and reusing it uh, in all parts of the system. That's the trade off you're getting into basically. But the logic of the a uh, specialized 32-bit adder can be optimized. And people have actually done a lot of research on how to do the addition fast, because addition is a very uh, common operation, clearly. Multiplication is also. So uh, people have devoted a lot of time into understanding how to build better adders, better multipliers, with logic optimization, also with algorithmic optimization, because logic optimization is one thing, algorithmic optimization is another thing. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but this is one example of an adder that's extremely fast. It's not the fastest adder. That has been developed. But the idea over here is you basically uh, create four bit adders as opposed to one bit adders. And the four bit adders are actually, uh, let's say, optimized based on their sum of product forms, for example. But you also have very specialized logic for carry generation because the carry is on the critical path, right? The 32nd, the last adder still needs to receive its carry. So if you actually create a very specialized logic that can generate these carries earlier and independently, then Potentially, you can actually speed up the addition. And this is one example of specialized logic at the core of some calculation that we use everywhere, addition. Uh, we've seen specialized logic to do matrix multiplication. We've seen specialized, uh, well, specialized processors to do graphics, uh, specialized processors to do video encoding. But the, this notion of specialization is at the core of what we do. Even when we build an adder, we want to specialize it so that we can actually make it fast. If you don't do that specialization, then you come up with a very nice modular, simple ripple carry adder that's slow and not efficient. So basically takeaway I think is that by doing specialization, specialized design, you can generate much faster and much more efficient logic. And again, I don't expect you to understand or know care look at adder and I didn't explain how it works clearly. It's beautiful. You can read about it in your textbook, uh, but there's a lot more research on adders. There are hundreds of th different types of adders that people have developed over time. Okay, any questions? Multipliers also. Multiplier is actually another thing. And then you can think of dividers, square root takers, etc. Or some the things that implement tangent, tangent functions, etc. Okay, let's talk about programmable logic array. This is 
Actually, we've seen things like this before. Uh, we're just going to call it a programmable logic array in a little bit with some formalization. So he called sum of products leads to two-level logic. This is the function that we've seen, one, one function. And you see this two-level logic. This is really the decoder, right? Well, part of a decoder at least. Uh, the three min terms uh, are here. If you have three functions, you really have eight of these uh, end gates if you really have a full decoder. And then this is the OR gate. So basically two-level logic of end gates and OR gates. Okay. And a PLA, programmable logic array, implements a sum of products implementation of any M, N input M output function. So what does that mean? Basically, this is what, what we have. In a PLA, programmable logic array, we have a decoder that generates all the min terms of a three input function in this particular case. So you have eight of these min terms. And any of those min terms can be connected to any of these wide OR gates, eight input OR gates, X, Y, Z. So you can implement any uh, three input, three output function this way, because you, gen you generate any possible min terms and you can connect any of those possible min terms through reconfigurable connections that I'm not going to explain over here, but you can think of how those connections can be constructed using multiplexers, for example. That's one way. Or using something that serves like, uh, that functionally acts like multiplexers. There could be fuses also. There are different ways of implementing these connections actually, but multiplexer is a good way of thinking. Uh, basically, you can connect any of these min terms to any of these uh, outputs so that you can implement any one bit function over here as a function of these three bit inputs. Now, this is beautiful. You can implement any function on this. And this is really a very common building block for implementing any collection of logic functions one wishes to. It's an array of AND gates, a decoder, basically, as you can see, uh, followed by an array of OR gates, as you can see, and connections, of course, to enable. Uh, any, any min term can be connected to any of the input, any of the outputs. How do you determine the number of end gates? It's basically two to the number of inputs. I think I've given you this SOP. Remember, we're implementing the sum of products. This is the number of min possible min terms. For an M input logic function, it's two to the N basically. How do you determine the number of OR gates? That's basically how many output columns do you have in the truth table? If you have a one output, then you only use X over here or Y or Z. Right? Okay. Is this clear? Okay, the sum of products form. Let's take a look at some examples. How do you implement a logic function? You basically connect the output of an AND gate to the input of an OR gate if the corresponding min term is included in the SOP, just like you would be actually doing two level logic uh, using SOP, sum of products, uh, except you're just relying on the connections to magically connect the min terms uh, to here. Okay, so how do you program a PLA? You program the connections from the AND gate outputs to OR gate inputs to implement a desired function. You basically specify them and somebody connects them in, a, in an FPGA, for example, that happens. And we've seen FPGAs. So FPGAs actually initially use PLAs, but now they use more advanced structures like LUTs and some other interconnects that we didn't really cover, but some of which we covered. Now let's take a look at PLAs as an, at an abstract level. You basically have inputs and their array, implicants, that's after the decoder, and an OR array uh, to get the outputs. Now let's take a look at how you do the connections. This is one example. PLA function. Again, for more detail, definitely read uh, Harris and Harris, this chapter. But this uh, essentially implements uh, this function. X is equal to A bar B bar C or A B C bar, and Y is equal to A B bar. So how do you do that? By enabling those connections. Okay, and this is another way of looking at it. Uh, I'm, I'm not spending a lot of time over here because I'm going to give you another example over here, which is this one. Implementing a full adder using a PLA. So let's take a look at it. So this is a full adder, remember, is a three input, two output function, right? A, B, carry in, and then sum and carry out. This is a one bit adder. Truth table, we've already seen, looks like this. And this is the PLA implementation, basically. If you look at the implementation, there are some, again, we're not showing exactly how things are connected because it becomes a mess over here, but these are configurable interconnections. You basically, uh, X is not used, this output is not used. But sum is really connected to the min terms over here. And you can, by looking at the picture, you can convince yourself that sum is, this OR gate is connected to the min terms where sum is equal to one. And this OR gate for carry out is connected to the min terms where carry out is equal to one. And these are the min term generators or a decoder, basically. Okay, and you can see that this input should not be connected to any outputs. Why? Because for this input, which is, which corresponds to min terms zero, 
None of the outputs is one. Clearly, that should not really enable any of the OR gates. That's good. And we clearly don't need this output because we only have two outputs over here. So using a three input, three output PLA, we can implement a three input, three input two output function. In this particular case, uh, a full adder. Okay, any questions here? We still did not optimize. PLA is not an optimal form, as you can see. It's sum of product form. So it's actually very generous in terms of hardware area. This is very costly, right? Because it has all min terms and large OR gates and OR gates with depend on how many min terms you have clearly because, and then interconnects that we didn't completely specify how to build. Those interconnects are actually quite complicated and there are a lot of multiplexers over there. So this is actually a very costly thing, but it enables implementing any possible function. Right? And you can reconfigure the connections potentially. If you actually have a programmable engine, you can reconfigure these connections and connect different min terms to different outputs and essentially implement any three input, three output function this way. So it's beautiful actually, it's very powerful, but it comes at a cost. Now here, you have a circuit that can do any three input, three output function, but it's costly in terms of hardware. Okay, so this also, again, uh, uh, as I said, I was going to discuss logical completeness, so let's discuss that. Basically, any logic function we wish to implement could be implemented using a PLA, and PLA consists of only AND gates, OR gates, and inverters, and we just need to connect accordingly to implement the intended logic function. And we said that AND or NOT is logically complete, uh, because essentially, without using any other gate, we can implement any truth table we wish. NAND is also logically complete, so is NOR, and your task is to prove this. I'm not going to, I think I've already kind of proven it actually, but I'm not going to do that. So uh, in, in further detail at least. There are more combinational blocks. Let's cover some of them quickly. You will see them later on. They're not, I mean, they're essential, but they're not as essential as what we have seen. That's why they're covered over here. So let's take a look at them. And I would suggest, uh, basically these are some readings that, where you can see these combination blocks. Chapter five will be required, but we're not going to cover everything in the lectures. At least the parts that are covered in lectures, you can take a look. And you would uh, basically greatly benefit by reading the combinational parts of chapter five. Let's take a look at it. So one example is compared. Basically you're comparing if two numbers are equal to each other. This is also called an equality checker. Check if two n input values are exactly the same. Well, this is the high level module representation, four bits. This means that this is a four bit value, this is a four bit value. And you're comparing whether all of the bits are exactly the same. What does it take to compare if two bits are exactly the same? An XOR or XNOR gate, basically. XOR can do that, but XNOR actually enables the output equal to uh, B1 over here. But basically, this is you, for each bit, you have an XNOR gate uh, that compares. And if, if the values are not equal, this results in a zero. And as a result, the equal value results in a zero. And you can convince yourself that it, this works. In parallel, you compare all bits. And if any bits, if all bits are equal in the end, all of the XNOR gates will evaluate to one and the equal bits will be equal output will be one. You can convince yourself. This is one way of building it. There again, other ways, remember. This may not be the optimal way, think about it. Okay, arithmetic logic unit. You will see this when we build a processor. This is actually important. Uh, this arithmetic logic unit actually does different arithmetic operations. Instructions specify what arithmetic operations can be carried, logical operations can be carried. I'm gonna give you one example from your book. Basically, it's a larger block that combines arithmetic, logical, arithmetic and logical operations into a single unit. Now we're building bigger blocks, but it performs only one function at a time. Of course, you can potentially uh, separate into multiple and perform multiple functions, usually denoted with this symbol. It looks like this. It's called an ALU, AL, uh, arithmetic logic unit. Here, it's it, it function. there's a function input, three bits in this case. It can do eight functions. And there are two inputs, A and B, M bits, and the output is M bits. And this is the specification, basically. If the function is 0, 0, 0, this function does bitwise end of A and B, N input values. If this function is, was 0, 1, 0, it does an addition. In this case, it's an addition. Unfortunately, plus is overloaded, but this is a real addition, binary addition. If the function is 1, 1, 0, it's a subtraction, for example. Basically, you can get the idea. Internally, clearly, it needs to be implemented using some gates, but you can see some of the gates. This combines, basically, multiplexers, inverters, a lot of things that we saw actually. And this is uh, this another multiplexer as you can see. Uh, so basically you can convince yourself that this ALU does what it promises to do. We'll see it more when we get to the next lecture, but this is just to familiarize yourself that you can build a larger combinational block called arithmetic logic unit 
based on everything we have seen so far. There's no magic in it. Arithmetic logic in it is not magic. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I was expecting. SLT is set less than. Basically, it's a function in MIPS, as you will see and implement. Uh, it's setting the output uh, to one if A is less than B. Otherwise, it's setting the output to zero. It turns out it's an instruction in the instructions and architecture, as we will see. Okay, excellent. So for more combinational build blocks, I mean, you can implement many things, and clearly we don't have time to cover everything, right? Subtractor, shifter and rotator, multiplier, divider. These are all combinational blocks, and you can find information about them. What I would like to cover in the last minutes is tri-state buffer. This is interesting. Uh, this is actually fun. Uh, this is actually very simple. It enables gating of different signals onto a wire. So it looks like this. You can see how simple it is, right? It's actually a switch, as we will see. Basically, it has two inputs, an enable input and, and a data input, and, and an output clearly. So if enable is zero, output is undefined. It's called floating, meaning uh, this uh, basically output is undefined. You don't pass the input to the output. You don't touch the output. If enable is one, then A uh, up, uh, output uh, gets the value of A. And you can see the truth table. Now we have another interesting over here, Z. It's called a floating signal. Floating signal is a signal that's not driven by any circuit. Remember, we discussed it actually when we talked about the transistors, open circuit or floating wire. Now this could be useful when you're connecting multiple components to a single wire or a bus, as we will see in a little bit. But you can think of this as a switch also. In fact, you can use, you can implement using, you can implement something like this using a transistor or a pass gate, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, a tri-state buffer acts like a switch. If enable is zero, this is an open circuit. If enable is one, this is a wire. Makes sense, right? So why is this useful? Uh, why am I telling you this basically? So imagine a wire connecting the CPU and memory. At any time, only the CPU or the memory can place a value on the wire because they need to communicate through this wire but not both, because if both of them place a value, a short circuit happens and you basically have garbage uh, in the, on the bus or wire. You can have two tri-state buffers, one driven by the CPU, one and the other by memory, and ensure at most one is enabled at any time. Now let's take a look at this pictorial. This is what happens in real systems, actually. You have a wire, it's called the bus. It could be multi-bit, but I mean, imagine that it's a single bit. Usually it's a 64 bits, for example. CPU may be sending something to memory, or memory send, can be something, sending something to CPU. You control the enable input. If CPU is sending to memory, you this, and you disable this, and then there's another connection that I don't show over here that goes into memory, uh, but ignore that for now. But basically, if CPU is sending something, you enable this tri-state buffer such that CPU's data goes on the bus and gets to whatever, wherever it needs to go. And uh, if memory is sending something, then you, you ensure that this is enabled and this is disabled so that memory stuff goes to where it needs to go. Now from your book, this is actually more sophisticated. In a real system, you may have many things connected to the bus or wire, processor, video, ethernet, memory. You can keep adding different accelerators potentially. And you can see that this actually works with uh, two, uh, two tri-state buffers over here. Uh, one is controlling what goes from the processor to the bus. And the other is controlling what goes, what comes from the bus into the process. So these are two different tri-state buffers. Anyway, uh, you can, you will see, we'll see more. One interesting thing is you can actually design a multiplexer using tri-state buffers. So these are actually really fun things, right? So this is your multiplexer using tri-state buffers. You may have actually realized this. Tri-state buffers can enable this sort of multiplexing. These are two tri-state buffers. This is a two-to-one multiplexer, data zero, data one, and the select input. If the select input is zero, this is enabled, so Y becomes D0. This is disabled because select them to zero. So Y is D0. If the select input is one, this is disabled, this is enabled, so Y becomes D1. So we're implementing this logic function using trace state buffers only. So that now you've seen another way of building a multiplex using an even simpler logic element called tri state buffer. Okay, this is a four to one multiplex here using tri state buffers. Again, you need AND gates also, unfortunately, over here, right? I didn't show that, and the NOT gates clearly over here. Okay, and this is our full to one multiplexer. This was our previous four to one multiplexer. You can see how, let's say simpler it is to actually use this sort of multiplexer, tri-state buffer. So there are some cases where tri-state buffers are more efficient. There are some cases where they may not be as efficient. Uh, for example, if, the, uh, if you have 1,024 to one max, tri-state buffers may not be as efficient. Okay, this is a great place to stop. Uh, I will see you tomorrow, and tomorrow we will start 
sequential logic. Thank <laughs> you.